Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I am so excited to talk to you and to have John Dunsmore, who is my dear friend, my mentor, and who is a leader in the space of everything leadership, mindset, innovation. And John, I just I look up to you so much because you have kind of paved the road in my world on what it looks like to be innovative and really making an impact on safety culture. And I feel like um, we'll get so much, I don't even want to get too much into it right (laughs) off the bat, but for everybody who doesn't know, guys, John is the Director of Business Innovation for Rocky Mountain Education Center here in Colorado and also Colorado's OSHA training institution. And John teaches um, an array of classes and leadership and impacting culture and businesses in oil and gas, construction, all businesses. Um, But John, welcome. Thank you so much. I don't know if I can live up to that introduction, but I appreciate it. I'm in the I'm in the lucky position, Apollonia, of being able to uh, spend time researching what's new. I mean, that's just, you know, and so much has happened just in the last couple of years that being in the position to get paid to go look at what's new has been a, an amazing privilege. And RMEC has backed me up on this saying, well, you're, you've got innovation in your title. You might as well go try and live up to it. And the, the entrepreneurship part, portion of it. So, What's happened, and, and I think I can best explain this by talking about, about the changes that have taken place. Now, yeah. there's no one that hasn't been just hammered by the changes. And I want to go back to a, to a theory that, that started in 1962. And in that, in that year, um, some gentlemen came up with the idea of diffusion of innovation, mm-hmm. which means you have innovators that start out with a process and then you have early adopters and then you have uh, what they call early majority, late majority, and then you've got laggards out there that that, that don't usually catch on. To put this in perspective, what we're doing right now, this kind of uh, computer interview, if you will, Mm -hmm. we've had it since 1986. Now think about it. We've had this kind of technology since 1986, and in 35 years, we used a little bit, but all of a sudden COVID came along and slapped society upside the head. And forced us. And forced us. To embrace innovation. <laughs> and, it didn't, and you're right, it wasn't embraced until it was our only option. Right. I, what I am so excited to really pick your brain about today is John gets to travel the world. John, you travel the world of studying businesses, being able to um, teach classes, get to know these students that are curious and hungry to learn more about how can I make an, an impact on the culture at my company. And John's been to Dubai and so many other crazy places and have taught the same message. And I guess my big question is, what has changed over the last 12 months in safety and culture from everything that you're seeing around the world? How are companies looking at safety the same? Is it different? And if it is different, how? No. Um, And I think if, if you look at OSHA, for example, as an institution, it has been extremely conservative for years. And I mean that in the business sense. Um, If you're going to test somebody for OSHA uh, testing for mandatory classes, they have to be present. They have to be in the classroom. They, you have to monitor them. You have to, to do all these things. I mean, it's the rules for teaching OSHA numbered classes have been very strict for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Well, along came COVID. And along came, then came COVID. COVID. And along came COVID. Well, and along came COVID, even at the highest levels of OSHA that has been very, very change resistant. Yes. Oh they my started gosh. changing. Yeah. So what happens is that change at the highest of levels has permitted us to institute changes that we hadn't planned on doing for years. So now we're able to train on OSHA numbered classes virtually with proctors with the same certification results that has been forbidden 
before that. Yes. So this, this fundamental shift in thinking has allowed us to use technology that's been available, as I said, since 1986. Yeah, and right before, we can even take it back further. That's what's been, and I see that. I, I, I mean, just the, the in-person OSHA 10 and 30, I know that there are a few online providers, but for the most part, well, I guess it was pretty black and white. We couldn't ever, even if you're an authorized instructor, to teach an OSHA 30 general industry course. We couldn't do that over Zoom. We couldn't teach remotely. It had to always be in person. So I see that so much has shifted online, which has been huge. And so what about what about right before COVID hit and kind of that peak? Um, what were you seeing as far as safety goes in, in the construction companies that you work with and oil and gas? Were you seeing any trends as far as their training program went? Um, do you, are companies starting to adopt this idea that let's not so much spend so much time training regulations, but let's focus on the leadership and mindset? Or do you see companies are embracing that more? That's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, Aristotle was talking about our capacity for making critical judgments depends on making them. So you can have regulations and you can teach regulations, but when you teach critical thinking, judgment, then you're changing the game. Because when somebody's in the field, I've never met anybody yet, except for Dale Robinson, who's amazing at this. He's amazing. I mean, he can, he can look at a trench and quote you chapter and verse of what, uh, you know, CFR applies. Yes. But Safety doesn't mean you need to know the CFR number. It means that you have to instinctively understand what's going on here. And, and not just for the sake of regulations, but the, the capacity to make critical judgments. So training has been shifting that I see okay. from a fact-based database to an experiential-based yeah. uh, type of training. That is what makes me so excited every time I talk with you is that I, from the beginning, when we first started talking about safety and culture and mindset leadership is I always strongly believe that it's not the regulations that people are missing because from experience being a safety director and doing hundreds of incident investigations and root cause analysis and, and investigating near misses, almost every single time the employee said, I knew what I was doing was wrong. There was very, there's been very few cases where somebody said, I am blindsided here. I had no idea that what I was doing was going to get me hurt. Everybody, yeah. everybody has said, I, I knew what I was doing, but I did it anyways. And I decided to take a risk. So where we share the same mindset and philosophy is that making an impact on a safety culture has everything to do with the leadership and the culture of that company and decision making, like you said, and what kind of leadership skills do these employees have in their in their toolkit um, versus just the the regulation side of things. So, what has been the most exciting thing in your classes teaching <laughs> leadership, <laughs> teaching teaching leadership and teaching mindset and culture? from the trainings that you've done around the world, what has been fascinating to hear from your students? What have they taught you when it comes to safety? We need to trust them. Is that what you're hearing? Think from the about students? that. We need to trust them to learn, but we need to trust them because decision-making when it's pushed down to the lowest level so that the guy in the trench, he may not know the CFR, but is unafraid to teach an older person, a person the same age, a person younger, and I'm talking about the length of time that they've been working, right, right. their ability and willingness to teach, to engage in that critical thinking practice is, the, is what's making the, the big difference. Think about the way we experience events. Now, recently I watched an event where it was, it was reported on television. The, the, the Pope addressed, you know, bazillion people in, in, um, in, the, uh, in the square outside the Basilica. And uh, what you saw 
were tens of thousands of cell phones being held up to record the event. Mm -hmm. So people were not so much engaged in the moment of time. They were engaged in, in some other recording of, of that. And part of our training, when we just do uh, PowerPoint and so forth, people are disengaged. They're engaged somewhere else because our competitors for training mm -hmm. at Polonia are not other professionals not other safety professionals. Our competitors are the YouTube influencers, Netflix, Amazon Prime. That's the standard of information transfer and, and you know gamification of training that I see going on all over the world. I completely agree with you that if we... So where I like where you're going with this, the quality of training is what you're touching on. And the experience of training is going to matter moving forward. If you're a safety director, if you're a, if you're anyone in leadership, or if you're just trying to make an impact in your company, you're saying that the experience of the training itself is going to be crucial if you want to make an impact on your safety culture. It can't be death by PowerPoint. It no, can't be. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I mean, first of all, printing Gutenberg, the, the printing press, killed the oral tradition of storytelling. Think about it. PowerPoint killed the old-fashioned, you know, put the, put the, I mean, you don't even have projectors like that anymore. If you can find them, they're in a museum probably. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, and, and what you're going to find very shortly is a PowerPoint presentation is going to be as archa archaic. People are going to turn off just instant. They're gone because they've, this culture has raised the level of expectation of engagement. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, to, to make it practical for our listeners and our viewers, if, if you're speaking to a safety manager right now, if you had a, a, a client, a customer, a safety director that says, John, I hear what you're saying. I work for a construction company, an oil and gas company. We have around 50 employees. I'm the safety director. I, I, I feel like I'm fighting an uphill battle every day. All my guys and gals in the field hate training. How can I take your message and how can I start making uh, an impact or an improvement on my training program today? Okay. What can I do differently? Help okay. me make an impact. Let, let me give you an example. We started out in February of last year. And I mean, obviously in March, everything boom, blew up. But in February, RMEC started a program by which we were out there by you in Frederick, mm -hmm. and we were looking, we were teaching a course on trenching. Yes, yes, I remember. Okay, I remember, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, technology that used to cost tens of thousands of dollars yeah. is now a couple hundred. So I would say what we did is and we went up there and we got in the trenches, but we got in the trenches. I, I brought this along just to, just to show you. This is, this is called a Rilo. I have nothing to do with that. I bought one, but this was only $200, okay. but this is a 360 camera. Okay. So you put it on a pole and you walk around a trenching site uh -huh. and you can, now this is the lowest level of engagement. I mean, there's mm -hmm. three levels of what they call haptic engagement. This is the lowest level of it. This is this is just the non-immersive virtual reality. But you walk, we walked around this site and we just followed people doing trenching work. They were actually pulling pipe. Okay. And they purposefully, for our for our benefit, made some mistakes. They got in trenches that were too deep. They you know they just they did a lot of things for us to show off, and they just went about doing it. They didn't say anything. They just did it. Okay. And we took this this 3d uh, and we, we took this 3d about i don't know three to five minute clips mm -hmm. and we put it on a, a qr code so that we're sitting here talking like this and you can take your cell phone and click on the qr code and do a 360 look at everything around you look so at it's the job site before you even enter the job exactly but it's a but it's a it's existing technology that almost everybody has almost 80 percent of the world's population has access right now to smartphone technology gps right, right so therefore 
your workers in the field, I mean, I would be stunned if they said, what's that? Well, uh, it's a cell phone, <laughs> you know, so you know that. Yeah, but yeah. here's what we were able to do. We were able to go back into the classroom and we'd only done one class when COVID hit, mm -hmm. but we were able to hit this with a QR code, what we were able to produce. And everybody in the class was sitting there moving around and looking and they were able to say, oh, look at that error. Look at that problem. They were, they were directly engaging with the technology. Oh my goodness, John. So, this is so good. Well, I don't know this if it's so good. This is huge. Because but, just by you painting that picture of that experience, I mean, it's it's not rocket science to really no. understand what what a great class could be or what a great experience would be because if I was in the scenario that you just described there, of course I would I would leave that class feeling like this is something that I, I have actually taken away tools from this course versus just watching a PowerPoint of, in theory, a trench does this, looks like this. You need to do this. Don't do this. But if I can't see it and if I can't experience it, you, you're, not, you're not hitting home to me. So that's really interesting. Okay. Apollonia, the, the, the independence of the student in the classroom to be able to take something that's very familiar to them and look anywhere right down to their feet. I mean, they can look at the clouds in the sky and we saw them waving all over the place because what they were doing is bringing their, their independent observation, their critical thinking to that job site. I see that hence why people were saying, Hey, I, I see that so and so is doing something it's, wrong. Hey, that trench that doesn't that, that doesn't look right. And everybody would move over and look at that area. So you'd see the the way in which they were looking around and then they would focus together as students doing critical thinking. So it's inexpensive. It's something that any trainer that's that's training a company right now can do. Wow. To up their game and get away from death by PowerPoint. Wow. And it was the it was the talking point of those students when we came away to say, how do we get more? How expensive was this to do? Mm -hmm. Because we were training trainers as well. It's not that expensive anymore. Wow. And you know, I submit to you that our ability to engage with technology and and um, critical thinking tools is the direction that this is all moving. It was what I ran into when I was in Saudi Arabia. It was stunning to me that the Saudis took their their uh, one of the refinery plants mm -hmm. and they mapped it in 3D. Okay. Wow. And it's and the and there's a there's a security road between the training center and the the refinery. No one gets to cross that road until they inside the training center can with their haptic devices turn valves, respond to emergencies and pass those kinds of technical questions in the safety of a classroom. It's like a, a virtual training room. Absolutely. And they're doing virtual on the job training with the same valves that they would be seeing Everything. in their actual facility. Um, and they're performing lockout tagout procedures Everything. or doing it on a live job site. And until you pass that, until you pass that course, you're not allowed to go onto the site. They okay. spent $500 million doing this virtual reality thing. It was beyond anything I had ever imagined. I'm sure that we have equivalents, but I'd never seen it. Now I wanna put in a, not a plug, but I wanna put in a, a, a notation for your trainers. 3M is right now working with a company called Striver. And Striver is one of the, the leading um, haptic and th three-dimensional companies working out there and they do custom work. But 3M is building a tremendous system for training to use their their safety equipment. Okay. So there are courses being offered for trainers to learn how to use and implement this kind of technology. So it's not all secret. It's not all something you've got to go do study on your own right. because there are the big companies that have lots to invest that are building these systems for us 
in such a way that we can, if we want, get away from death by PowerPoint yeah. and without tremendous cost, mm -hmm. intriguingly engage our workers in critical thinking skills. I love that. I love that. What I'm hearing you say is that virtual training and exploring these critical thinking skills in the classroom, enhancing the experience in the classroom, that's the future of safety training. Yep. If you yeah. want to make an impact. This is, this is what I think we can look forward to within the next couple of years, not the distant future. These are, these are processes that are being done right now and we can John, can't. you're always bringing the future. Oh my, you always get me so excited. <laughs> you're always bringing the future to us. And oh my gosh, okay, okay. Go well, these, these three categories of haptic, and haptic means feedback, where you can actually feel, you know, we could say kinesthetic. But these three categories of haptic systems are currently available, and we're only refining them. It's not like this is future, future shock. This is available now. One is called the graspable, so you could actually teach people how to run a machine because of the, the controls. Mm -hmm. The wearable is, is amazing in that you can, uh, you can virtually pick up a, a cup and you would feel the cup in your hand because it gives you feedback, pressure yes. feedback to the cup. Wow. And then the touchable where you can reach out and touch things. They're using that a lot in medical situations where they're learning to do operations and so forth. And they can, their fingertips feel the feedback. So and these different types of haptic systems are being developed right now and are available. I mean, they, in fact, the graspable and the wearable, you may be familiar with them in terms of we and some of the exercise things right. that we're doing is gaming right now. So this is, this is something that is available to us that our trainers can use. A lot of times companies like 3M and like Striver will share this with you for testing purposes. And your obligation, of course, is to give them feedback. Wow. Do you know anyone? I, I just, it's going to take a second for me to just <laughs> digest what you gave because that is such a game changer. I see that in in the training world as far as heavy equipment training or lockout tag out training where it's more of a, a systematic process and so getting your hands on it and actually being able to do hands-on training not only virtual but hands-on training before you step foot on that job site is is a game changer i mean i think that's where the magic's at i know that's where the magic's at well, think, think about this, Apollonia. Right now, we're teaching a, a Harwood course on Hascom with, a, with an add-on with COVID. Well, the add-on with COVID is not just about, there's only like four references in the CFRs that actually relate to, you know, uh, you know disease control, you know, uh, that kind of process mm -hmm. or chemicals that would be done with that. But, but think about the practicality of how we humans operate. Now we have a greater threat. The level of sanitation has risen significantly mm -hmm. in terms of, of uh, you know, disinfectants and so forth. You have frontline workers who are responsible for disinfecting. Mm -hmm. Common sense says that if one is good, like using ammonia, then two and, uh, and the other one would be bleach. Mm -hmm. Well, if bleach is good and ammonia is good, then putting the two together is stronger. Unfortunately, those kinds of combinations are not good. They're right. deadly when you have different kinds of cleansers that you would, not, you would think to train. Well, with using haptic devices, what we can do is have people go into a virtual has, you know, a virtual uh, locker, a, a virtual locker okay. and mixing chemicals and cleaning chemicals into what, you know, what solutions and, and, uh, and so forth. And if you make a mistake, you know, there's consequences for it. Yeah. So there's, there's so many ways in which we can subtly introduce this kind of training where the critical of thinking that they're doing is not just up there. Don't mix this and don't mix that on a screen, but the, the actual, don't mix this and don't mix that is because you have to go in there and mix and do and dilute mm -hmm. and apply. Does what that make is, sense? 
It does. And it's, yeah, I mean, it goes back to just, like you said, practical, being practical about how us humans learn and interact. And so it makes sense. It, all of this makes sense. And so um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see companies do in their training programs? So when you're training safety managers, um, or even frontline employees, and they're kind of describing their training program, what do you see that companies are often doing wrong? And what can they do about it? Well, when you do something wrong in good faith, it's, it's, it's really hard to judge. I mean, not gonna, gonna, we, we try to do our best. This is not a matter of right and wrong. This is a matter of opportunities that have expanded and we can either take advantage of these new opportunities or not. But yeah. you could still be doing handouts and, and doing a projector. It's, not, <laughs> it's yeah. not wrong so much as are you, are you really training students to the best of their capacity to learn wow, and that right. and think about it this way Apollonia the OSHA Act was passed in 1970 and mm -hmm. we were killing about 15,000 people a year mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons they got passed because we were as I say it wasn't that people were walking down the street and getting struck by lightning on the job it was preventable accidents right, that were causing right. 15,000 deaths and, and I don't even know how many injuries We've reduced that in all these years down to about four or 5,000 a year. It's still too many, mm -hmm. but we still have a lot of injuries that, that are preventable. Right. So why would we not take advantage of every single opportunity we have to expand our training capacity to increase their critical thinking? I love... The, one, the, the, only, the only problem I have, Apollonia, is with one-way training, you know, the, the, the sage on the stage kind of stuff. Okay, I was going to say, what do you mean by that? All right, so just well, the one know-it-all that is. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what, I, what, I've, <laughs> what I've done in my old age is to, to allow people to train me. Mm -hmm. I've seen that in your courses, and that's, what, that's, what have, that's what's made the best training. When we were training at um, the women's prison here in Colorado, I learned so much from the other students in the course. And I love your approach when training is that I don't have all the answers, but I have something you might be interested in. I have some tools that yeah. you might. And so the way you facilitate a class that prompts classroom discussion and, and people sharing their own stories and experiences, that works. Yeah, it that does. Works. We need to trust our workers to be smarter than we think they are. I mean, that's okay. that because it, they will live down to our lack of trust if we go that direction. Wow, I can't agree with you more. And kind of led into a direction I wanted to ask, or a question I wanted to ask was, what do you think is the main reason for the deaths on the job that we still have today? What do you think? I know there's, I know there's statistics, there's OSHA's top 10, and I don't want to get into the nitty gritty, but why do you think companies are still experiencing fatalities? Uh, is that a personal question or is this a... Uh, yeah, just a personal, uh, just a philo just your philosophy having been all over the world that, you know, I'm not even honing into just Colorado and... Um, Apollonia, when, when we when we as a, as a people, we, we as a culture, when we as a nation allow ourselves to think in terms of us and them, we're denigrating them. They're worth less than us. And I don't care where you make that, whether it's in a generational, because a lot of times we'll see, you know, the, 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 uh, the boomers will say, you know, I've got all this experience and you know, go away, kids, you don't know what you're talking about. And yet the young people say, go away, boomer, you know, okay, boomer, you don't know what you're doing. That's them, awesome. them, them pointing that, fingers. Yeah, and that's, that's an intergenerational issue. But on the same time, interculturally, when we divide ourselves into us and them, one of the things RMEC has done a better job of is 
absolutely demanding. We will have uh, everything we do translated into Spanish. Now that's that's a beginning. That's not an end. I I was so proud of that. I went down to Texas and I was in Houston teaching, and I had a guy raise his hand and say, uh, uh, "Would you? Where's the where's the uh, Vietnamese translation?" And I went. Vietnamese. Whoa. Said, yeah, we, have, we have 80 Vietnamese engineers in our company who need this kind of training. And yes, they speak English, but their primary language, as you know, for OSHA, their primary comfort language is Vietnamese. I said, well, I'm sorry, but we're, uh, we're behind the power curve on that one. Um, yeah. you know, so the, the more we can integrate literally and figuratively our care for others, it oh, changes that, that because we need to rely upon the critical thinking of people who don't think like us. Wow. Yeah, I agree. And the more you can see that in a company yep. is where you see trust being built. Yes. And when trust in, is being built, the level of care of the person you're working next to you actually means something to you and would hopefully get you to say, Hey, something that you're doing is off. I don't feel right about this. Let's stop the job. Let's take a second. Let's take a break. And I think that's, I think that approach versus more safety regulations. I, and I, and I think knowing the regulations is super important. I know you oh, think that is. too, but it, it's, it, it, there's so much beyond that. And I am so grateful for your conversation today. Oh my goodness. And I like how you said, this is just the beginning. Trans, so for safety directors, leaders out there listening to this, this is just the beginning. And I love how you said that this is not the end. And I think there's a ton of practical tips that you could take away today um, and really start thinking about how you can make an impact for your company, how you can raise the level of engagement um, at your company. If you're a safety director, if you're um, just a leader, if you're just a team member. So that's awesome. Do you have any other final thoughts? Well, don't, for us? don't be, if you're a trainer, don't be afraid to reach out to colleges, to training centers, to companies like 3M and Striver and so forth, and just ask. I mean, the worst that can happen is I say, no, we're not going to share with you, but that, that's not been my experience. Um, wow. That would be my recommendation. There's okay. so much out there that's available for free that's a game changer, but we have to get out of our resistance to change. Mm -hmm. COVID proved that we are very capable. RMEC transferred from on ground face to face to a completely on Zoom, we actually use uh, WebEx in 10 days. Dale Robinson did a magnificent job of a midair pivot. Well, wow. <laughs> produce yeah. this stuff. Yeah. So we are capable of far more than we're giving ourselves credit for being able to do to protect the workers in the field. So oh, that would, that would be my, my takeaway. That's a gift. That's a gift. I remember starting out in this industry and not knowing where do I go? <laughs> I'm a safety director. Now I'm in charge of the company safety program. Where in the world am I supposed to go? So I think, thank you so much for gifting those resources to the audience. Thank you so much, John. And I can't wait You're to welcome. interview you again. This will not be <laughs> the last time I would love to circle back and three months, six sure. months from now, and just see where the world is at in training and everything, just love to pick your brain. But it won't you. look like it does today. <laughs> it, yeah, that we do know, that we do know for a fact. So thank you, Apollonia. I greatly appreciate your time today, John. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, bye-bye.